So welcome back. We'll continue our discussion on from sentimentalism to sentimentality sentiments. Till now I talked about how we can move from <coughs> discussing the acronym FI. So from fickleness to firmness and from education to experience. So from experience to education. Sorry. So now let's move on. From exhibition to expression. <coughs> Many times people, if we go for Harinam Kirtan on the streets, people ask, so why do you have to express your why do you have to exhibit your devotion like this to the whole world? Devotion is a matter of the heart. A devotion is just a matter of the heart. You focus on that. Yes, devotion is a matter of the heart, no doubt. But what is in the heart needs to be expressed. And there's a difference between expression and exhibition. Now, <clears throat> in every relationship that we have, emotion needs to be expressed. If, say, in a family, the husband uh, is just staying at home, lounging, watching TV, playing some video games, mm -hmm. and the wife says, you know, we need to get the grocery, we need some money. He says, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then go and get a job and earn some money. No, I love you. Uh, or say, the husband comes back from office and the husband is tired and hungry. And then the uh, wife says, I love you. Okay, I'm hungry. I love you. <laughs> I'm hungry. I love you. <laughs> well, love is fine. But depending on whatever situation we are in, love has to be expressed through the appropriate actions. Emotion that is not expressed is who can know whether the emotion is there or not. So it may be there, it may not be there. So those who say that, oh, keep your devotion only in the heart, they themselves don't follow that with respect to any other field of their life. Everywhere, devotion has to be love, emotion, whatever it is expressed. Now, there is a difference between expressing emotion and exhibiting emotion. Expression is for the object of love. Exhibition is for the world. So, when we express our devotion, we want to, be, we want to connect more with the Lord. When we exhibit our devotion, that is, we simply want uh, uh, the admiration of the world. Like earlier I said that people who that people who just imitate that they have advanced emotions and they pretend to have tears in their eyes. They want to exhibit their devotion so that they can attract the world's attention. That is not our purpose. Our purpose is expression of emotion. Uh, Gaur Krishwadas Babaji the, grand, the spirit, grand spiritual master of Srila Prabhupada would give an example to illustrate the difference between the expression of emotion and exhibition of emotion. He says, he should say that if a woman is pregnant and she is in the final stages of, uh, of, uh, of labor when she is about to deliver, at that time she may, as the baby is just coming out, she may cry, she may scream at that time. Now, when, the, when she screams, you know, everybody runs over there, pays attention, the doctors, the midwives, the others, they all come and help. And through those cries, actually, a child is going to appear. Now, if some other woman who is not pregnant, she also starts screaming like that. <laughs> <laughs> she may scream and yell. But no child is going to be produced by that. <laughs> so similarly, he says, those who have authentic devotion, when they express that emotion, the devotion actually increases. There is a product, there is a fruit of that expression. And the fruit of that expression is the deepening of the devotion. So when great devotees chant and dance and sing in ecstasy, by that their ecstasy increases. But those who are just faking the devotion, they are simply exhibiting the devotion. They are like the woman who, has, who is not pregnant at all. No matter how much they fake the emotion, that is not going to lead to any deepening of the emotion. 
so now <coughs> the expression of emotion can lead to a deeper experience of the emotion and can lead also to the enrichment of the emotion so this is where <coughs> the people often say that okay that we want free love and now is there's a sexual revolution after which people say that oh we just want to there's free love do i can love anyone everyone no restrictions that is the idea now actually the word free love is an oxymoron oxymoron is a english figure of speech which refers to two contradictory words brought together like say if we say this person is a brilliant fool <laughs> what do you mean is a brilliant is he brilliant or is he foolish or it said that suicide is an act of courageous cowardies courageous cowardies normally courage and cowardies are opposite so when it and then people somebody feels they committing suicide say they go and lie down in the tracks of a train and i'm going to end my life and then as they hear the sound of the train coming they get up and go away maybe next time <laughs> <laughs> so actually to end one's life also requires courage but when a soldier is fighting on the war field and at and is laid down the life that is martyred that is glorious they are they are laying down their life for a higher cause but if somebody lays down their life gives up their life because of frustration that inability to face life's problems is cowardice so courageous cowardice is two opposite words which are brought together that's oxymoron that's the that's the english word oxymoron so free love is actually an oxymoron because whenever a love is there love is a limiter of freedom love by its very nature limits freedom you know say in any relationship say a man and a woman before they are married they can go anywhere they can do anything they can have any kinds of relationships but if they get married then that love leads to the limiting of the freedom but it's not just a limiter of freedom it is also the fulfiller of freedom what do we want freedom for we want freedom so that we can experience deeper richer emotions they when a couple get married they have a child now the child as soon as the child is there the parents they might be able to do so many things before but the child comes they have to pay so much attention to the child and even after paying so much attention to the child children sometimes don't obey children do have their own minds and they do so many things which disrupt the parents so in a sense having parents limits the, limits the, having children limits the parents but then it also fulfills them as they help uh, as they see a new life appear and grow and become a wonderful person that fulfills them now many parents when their children don't obey them don't listen to them defy them they feel exasperated but how many parents would want to if replace their child with a obedient robot um. <laughs> you know you could get a robot but what what is the love in that you could just get a robot and uh, you could get that, that robot even to look like you but it is no there is no reciprocation about that so actually the limitation in the freedom is there when there is love but there is also the fulfillment of freedom so when we let ourselves be just wildly directed by emotions then that emotion that love doesn't really stay love if we do not expect accept the limitation then there is no fulfillment it's just like if there is a battery and that battery light is diffused everywhere then we can't see much clearly but then the battery light is focused then we can see something So similarly, love has to be limited to be focused. But when we love Krishna, at one level the love appears to be limited, but at another level it is not limited, because Krishna is the well-wisher of everyone. Krishna is the whole, and everyone is a part of Krishna. So when we love Krishna, actually by by our love for Krishna, gradually we develop love for everyone, and that's how. we grow in our devotion <clears throat> now why are we talking about this here we are talking about the 
principle of there is exhibition of love and there is expression of love so nowadays as the culture is becoming more and more materialistic to some extent is becoming more and more exhibitionistic also people want to people often exhibit their uh, their sensuality in public and they call it love but quite often we will find that those very people who exhibit their sensuality in public after some time they also exhibit their animosity in public <laughs> is it it uh, <clears throat> one of my friends is a is a marriage counselor so he tell me is actually a uh, marriage counselor so he said that that uh, his experience is that those relationships that are formed with intense emotion intense affection initially after a few months that it's almost you can predict with almost 100 percent frequency they will go through a phase of intense aversion so when there is exhibition of emotion there is exhibition of one kind of emotion there will be exhibition of another kind of emotion so the focus of the emotion is not just the when we are trying to practice bhakti we don't want to express we want to express the emotion not exhibit the emotion so when we are doing on harinam sankirtan is that's not an exhibition of it that's just an expression of our emotion and we say why are we doing it in public because we know that hearing krishna's holy names will purify everyone and we complete this so krishna's hearing krishna's names will purify everyone now some people may do bhakti in a very exhibitionistic way that is that is that is a limitation of their devotion but uh, for most of us it is the exhibition part might be there but the expression of what is there in our heart or what we desire to be there in our heart that is what will take us towards krishna gradually and for this to happen there are many people who are of this school called spiritual but not religious they say i don't want any rituals i don't want any dogmas i don't want any externals i just want to be open i want to be spiritual i want to experience something so the the intent of the spiritual but not religious crowd is often good they have been put off by the narrow mindedness of religionists they have been put off by the by the fanaticism of some religionists i was in texas and i saw uh, in front of me there was a car which is going and the car bumper there's a sticker it says oh god please save me from your creatures <laughs> no <laughs> normally god saves through his creatures <laughs> but in the creatures are holier than thou are condescending are hell and brimstone kind of preachers then people say, i don't want anything to do with these people so many times when people see this narrow mindedness they want to stay away from they want to stay away from religion so this that's their experience that's fine we can understand that experience uh, where they are coming from but spiritual is not just just a state of awareness it is also a level of reality i talk about physical mental and spiritual so now to rise to the spiritual level of reality we have to follow a process if we don't follow the process then whatever we call a spiritual it will be very ephemeral it will come and go and when we understand religion properly religion is the way to becoming spiritual so if you consider there's a mountain and the bottom of the mountain is material consciousness the top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness and the path up the mountain is the is a religion there can be different religions there can be different specific rituals that people may do to raise their consciousness upwards but if somebody does not do any rituals at all that doesn't necessarily mean that they are already spiritual they might just stay materialistic when there are certain rituals that are recommended in bhakti see the word sometimes words themselves acquire negative connotations so in today's world the word ritual itself has a negative connotation so it don't be ritualistic so we could use the word practices when there are some practices the purpose of those practices is to raise our consciousness from the material level to the spiritual level 
So if we understand this, the spiritual level is like the healthy, is like a spiritually healthy level. The material level of consciousness is the spiritually unhealthy level. So if somebody says I want to be spiritual but not religious, then they are saying like I want to be healthy but I don't want to take any treatment. I don't want to take any treatment. Yes, it's really good to want to be healthy is good. But you have to, if you are sick, you have to take a treatment to become healthy. So rituals or practices are means by which we can rise from material consciousness to spiritual consciousness. Let me give a simple example. Say so suppose right now mm, I lie back and lean back. I put my hands behind my head. I put my feet on this desk and while lying that I said I am feeling very humble now. <laughs> uh, that very posture is bossy. It is almost impossible to feel humble in that posture. So the, the, the physical condition affects our mental disposition. So when we come in front of the deities and we bow down, some people may do it ritualistically. But bowing down, offering respects, this actually creates a mood of reverence. It creates the appropriate mood of respect. So the rituals are means towards the emotions. The rituals themselves do not indicate the presence of emotion. But the rituals can be two things. They can either express the emotion if it is present or they can help us to experience the emotion if it is not present. That means, say, if we come to the temple and start doing kirtan, sometimes we are in so much, we already feel so much devotion that we happily do kirtans. But sometimes we don't feel at all devotional, but we start doing kirtans, trying to be as prayerful as possible. Then gradually that kirtan, singing that will make us feel devotional. So the practices are, me so if this is material consciousness, this is spiritual consciousness. The practices help us to rise to spiritual consciousness. So when we come in front of the deities and bow down, what is the purpose of bowing down before the deities? At one level, it's to express our subordination, our submission, our humility. For great devotees, they are so much in love of Krishna, for very advanced saints. When they behold the darshan of Krishna, they just seeing Krishna, they get so much ecstasy that they faint. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he first saw Jagannath, he came charging in and is running towards Jagannath. He fainted in ecstasy. So the Acharyas tell us the great saints faint and fall. If we cannot faint, we at least fall. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> we express our devotion by that action. So, so here the point is that the bowing down in front of the deities. This is the expression of our devotion. And by that expression, we can experience the devotion better. So, we have to be religious to be spiritual. Spiritual is the top of the mountain. Religious is the path to the top of the mountain. Now, when religion becomes fanatical, at that time people are saying, this is the only path to the top of the mountain. And all other paths are wrong. Some people spend their whole life going round and round at the bottom of the hill, pulling everybody down from all other paths. <laughs> but they themselves won't rise up any path at all. <laughs> so, yes, there can be some fanatical people who say, this is the only path. That fanaticism is unfortunate. But, there has to be a path to go up to the mountain. Otherwise, how will we get up? So, there has to be expression of devotion, expression of devotion, and the practices that we have, they offer us a structure by which we can express the emotion. Even in material life, there are so many rituals. When we meet people, we shake hands. And what is shaking hand? It's a ritual. Isn't it? It's a ritual. Ritual of greeting. When people have birthdays, they, they have a cake, they light a candle and they blow the candle. Now that's a ritual. And what, what, what do you get by blowing the candle actually? Actually, if you see history, it's not even just a ritual, it's a superstition. There is some ancient Scandinavian myth that 
uh, whenever a child grows that every year on the birthday of a child some evil spirit will possess that child and therefore and their idea was that if you light a candle and blow the candle that evil spirit will go away <laughs> so <laughs> now in today's scientific worldview we don't even believe in evil spirits but still we are doing that it's almost a universal practice so what has happened it's a ritual so rituals are there in every aspect of life every walk of life there are rituals when we see the national flag we are expected to salute when the national anthem is being chanted we are expected to stand attention so these are all rituals but these rituals help us to express emotions properly the, there can be two problems one is the rejection of the ritual entirely I won't do any ritual. Then the emotion will never come. The other is one do does the ritual, but without even without even trying to have any emotion. Then that ritual will not serve any purpose. So that is, uh, if we consider this is these are examples of what the Upadesha Amrut calls Niyamagraha. Niyamagraha means rejecting the rule itself or following the rule without understanding the purpose of the rule. So we don't want to exhibit our devotion for the whole world to know. We want to, but we do want to express our devotion so that we can better connect with Krishna. Now how is this related to sentimentalism and sentimentality, sentiments? So when there is exhibition of devotion, then when people feel these people are just putting on a show for everyone to see, then general people say these people are sentimental they don't have they don't have any substance in them so people in general can get alienated in india many times when there is bhagavad katha the bhagavad kathakars often they mix some practical wisdom some ayurveda some yoga some breathing exercises all that they mix and they give so once a bhagavad kathakar gave a class and while he was giving the class he was speaking sudama leela and in between he started speaking about potatoes 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 and he says potatoes are so bad for health potatoes should never be eaten they cause so much vat in the body this 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 <laughs> and after the bhagavad katha there was prasad and the prasad there was potatoes <laughs> <laughs> so then those who were serving then the preacher was also taking prasad so they the preacher the, the servers were serving because they had potato they served everyone they didn't have any other sabji but the the, the serving they didn't serve the preacher the potato <laughs> they serve me also he says but just now you said that potatoes are bad for health he says that is for the assassin <laughs> <laughs> that is for the speaker's podium i want potatoes now <laughs> <laughs> so if someone this makes a big show of things but doesn't practice it then people will people will reject that sentimentalism that is sentimentalism on the other hand even if we also practice bhakti just to show the world then when we are alone then we stop practicing bhakti then also we will not connect with krishna so we yeah we want to connect with krishna so the expression of devotion which is healthy exhibition is unhealthy and by understanding the purpose of the practices we will ensure that we can do the practices in a way that we express them we don't exhibit now now sometimes if a particular practice is not helpful in expressing devotion then we may decide that, that i will not do this practice and shila prabhupad came to india after he brought his western disciples and he took his disciple he told us in america at that time the devotees would go on hari naam kirtan and they would distribute books and when they did that in bengal at that time they found that some people some indians they were throwing coins at the devotees and they came, the devotees had never such a experience so they came back and told prabhupad and then prabhupad said that in bengal vaishnavism is seen as a poor man's religion or a poor man's excuse for religion and many people who are poor they just go around doing kirtans and they ask for some they want some money they are like beggars who sing sometimes in india also in mumbai and other places we see some locals 
Nowadays, of course, some people do kirtan, but many people sing Bollywood songs. <laughs> and they and give her free entertainment and they say, give us some money. So, Prabhupada said that this is, we don't want to be lumped with these people. So, Prabhupada says, stop doing Harinam. So, Harinam Kirtan is, is an essential part of our bhakti tradition. But if at a particular time, a particular practice is not leading to the intended result, then we have to recognize the purpose and make sure that the purpose is being fulfilled. And we may have to adopt a different practice for that. So, we have to be open. So, the, we be religious to be spiritual means we have to follow some practice to raise our consciousness to spiritual level. Now, which practice it may be, it may vary from, from place to place, from situation to situation. Bhaktisiddhan Thakur, uh, he was quite a, in many ways, a radical person. Whatever was required to attract people to Krishna, he would do that. And he, wa he had his theistic exhibitions. Theistic exhibitions would be huge grounds he would hire. And he would have on those grounds beautiful dioramas of uh, Krishna's pastimes, Lord Chaitanya's pastimes and various bhakti themes. And people would come to see that. But that was, the, the devotional part was one part of the theistic exhibition. Along with that he would invite scientists, educationists, social workers, and they would also come and put up their own stalls in the exhibition. And they would exhibit the latest scientific advances, they would expect, they would give some uh, health awareness about infectious diseases. Now many people would say, this is just mundane, why are you doing this? But Bhaktisanth Thakur said that, to see that people will come, and they come there, they will see our body of Vishnu exhibitions also. If we just say it's spiritual, nobody may come, or very few people may come. So then Bhaktisattva Thakur gave the example that if somebody wants to bathe in the Ganga, then they have to go to where the Ganga is flowing and bathe over there. And say somebody has had a family tradition of generation after generation people go and bathe in the Ganga. And they go to a particular spot and they offer their obeisances and they take a dip in the Ganga over there. But if the because if the path of the Ganga changes, if the path of the Ganga changes, the reverse, if you look at their history, sometimes their paths can change dramatically and whole civilizations can sometimes uh, get end if a river suddenly changes. Currently historians say that the Indus Valley civilization that was there, that is, a, like a, that is a offshoot of the Vedic civilization that was there 5000 years ago, the Mahabharata that changed because the Indus river that was there, it suddenly changed its path. So, uh, so Bhaktivedanta Thakur said that if somebody wants to go and take a bath in a river, then they have to go where the river is flowing right now. Not where the river was flowing when their ancestors were bathing. If they go there, their ancestors all went there. But if there is no water over there, what is the point of going there? So, his point was, tradition is important. But tradition's importance is to help us enhance our devotion. So, tradition is, is like the flow of the river. Devotion is like bathing in the river. Or, a tradition is like going to a particular spot to bathe in the river. Devotion is like bathing in the river. But, if a particular place, now there is no water, then we have to go where the water is. So, practices may sometimes need to be adapted according to time, place, circumstance. Say, in the past, people would go in the forest to hear from the sages. Now, there are very few people, there are very few forests only in most part of the world. There are very few people who want to go to the forest. And even if people want to go to the forest, there are very few sages in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> now, in today's world, we may sit at our homes and we may hear spiritual wisdom through the internet. We may see some classes, we may hear some classes. So, somebody may say, what is spiritual? You are sitting in front of a computer and watching it. But, the Ganga is flowing this way right now. So, where the Ganga is flowing, that's where we have to go. So, if we become totally dismissive of the rituals, 
that is a problem because there is no pathway to go towards go to the top but if you just get attached to the ritual or the practice and don't understand the purpose then you just keep doing the practice but it will not take us towards krishna so sentimentality can come in both ways we just we just become hooked to a particular practice and do it even if it is not serving the purpose or sentimentality can lead to aversion hey, this is pointless why do it just give it up so both ways it's a problem if you understand sentiment means we understand the purpose and we pursue that purpose through the appropriate practices and the last part now from lamenting to learning when we practice bhakti it is it is very easy actually to get overcome by negative emotions why is that because at first glance some people may start thinking that our philosophy is very pessimistic the philosophy says that oh actually this world is dukkhal hai this world is a place of misery yes that is true but what is the point of that so devotion is beyond material optimism but it is beyond material pessimism also there is material consciousness which itself is the problem and bhakti involves focusing on krishna and he is the source of the supreme spiritual optimism i'll explain what i mean by this that pessimism means sometimes people ask you know do you see the glass as half empty or as half full one of my friends was telling me when somebody asked me this question the only feeling i get is is the glass having enough water to throw on the person who's asking it <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so the idea is that yes we should look at the glass as half empty as half full and not half empty that is fine but um, still we are looking at that same glass only bhakti is not just about looking at the world it is about looking beyond the world to krishna we look beyond the world to krishna and bhakti is about lifting our vision to a higher reality not just looking at the positive in the present reality yes we do want to look at the positive also but that's not the focus the focus is look beyond the positive and the negative to the spiritual to the transcendent however if we do not understand this transcendental aspect of bhakti then we may misconstrue some of the emotions that are involved in bhakti so for example as i said people we hear that this world is a place of misery now what does it mean practically at the start of the bhagavad gita arjuna is in tears he is in great misery tam tatha krupaya avishtam ashru purna kulekshanam his eyes are overflowing with tears now does krishna tell arjuna Hey, this world is a place of misery you are in misery so stay miserable now <laughs> that that is not at all the purpose of krishna actually krishna speaks the bhagavad gita by which arjuna becomes encouraged and the, by the end of the bhagavad gita arjuna's composure is restored sthitosmi gata sandeha karishye vachanam tava sthitosmi i become well situated So when the bhagavad gita says this world is dukkhalaya if you look at the verse also is 8.15 it's a very interesting verse the, what the verse essentially says is mam upetya punar janma dukkhalema shashvatam napnuvanti mahatmana samsiddhim paramam gata the verse says that those who devote themselves to me they will not return to this temporary and distressful world but will attain my eternal abode so the stress of the verse is not that this world is a place of misery the stress of this verse is the potency of bhakti to take us to a higher destination so in that sense this verse is not pessimistic it's actually optimistic uh, uh, misery is a fact of of the world but it is not the purpose of the world what is the difference between that it's, it's a fact and a purpose it's like a hospital in a hospital pain is just a fact people are sick and sick people are in pain but 
pain is not the purpose of the hospital it's not all the medical staff is there with torture instruments to increase pain for the world. no actually in the hospital there is a whole mechanism to heal the patients so similarly when we are told by Krishna this world is a place of distress the point is this world is like a hospital take the bhakti treatment and get cured that is the stress of the Bhagavad Gita take the bhakti treatment and get cured so if we obsess too much on the negative oh this is bad this is bad this is bad this is bad then we do not connect with the positive sometimes when we start practicing bhakti and then initially when we hear about the philosophy it can be very powerful and then many devotees get some temporary uh, surges of renunciation I just want to renounce everything I want to give up my job I want to give up my family I just want to practice bhakti I remember when I was in when I was doing college preaching in India about 15 17 years ago there's one college student it was just in the second, first or second year of his college he's an engineering a top engineering college an IIT he was so he came to me and said that Actually, I just, this, this whole material knowledge, it's temporary. Prabhupada said these colleges are spiritual slaughterhouses. I just want to give up my education and I want to become a brahmachari. I said, okay, oh. Mm. So I said, okay. I said, right now you can complete your education. You're just new to devotion practice you complete your education generally what we encourage people is that you complete your education you complete your family responsibilities take care of the marriage of your sisters take care of your pack I mean some financial security for your parents and then if you feel inspired then you can join don't be sentimental about this and once he came second time he came I told him no wait and then the third time he came he said I'm going to I'm going to become a brahmacharya I'm going to join the temple I said no you should not do this he said I want to dedicate my life to Krishna and you are obstructing me in that. So just as Bali Maharaj rejected Shukracharya, I reject you. <laughs> so in the ninth canto of Shivan Bhagavatam, eighth ninth canto, there's a story. Bali Maharaj wanted to surrender everything to Vishnu and Shukracharya told him, don't do it. So he was drawing from scripture to try to justify his point. Now, the, after that, he went and joined the temple. And he stayed in the temple as a brahmachari for about one year. And then he said, this one year I have done enough bhakti for my whole lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> so, not only did he stop bhakti, you know, not even give up his renounce to order, but he stopped practice of bhakti also. So what happens, sometimes sentiment, if we are sentimental, we might just get too caught up by the negativity of this, oh, this world is temporary, this world is, it's all this is ignorance, all this is illusion. Yes, at one level, we could say it is illusion, but there is a process to come out of illusion. And we have to follow the process properly. So uh, by, uh, by sentimentality, we might just jump towards the renounced order or by sentimentality, we might become averse towards material things. Now, aversion is also a distraction and devotion. Just as attachment is a distraction and devotion, similarly, aversion is a distraction. Say, if somebody comes to a temple, but uh, in the temple, uh, they are attached to someone, hmm? materially attached, say. And they are trying to pursue a relationship with that person or whatever. Then they come to the temple, their consciousness is not towards the deities also. Has this person come? When is he going to come? So attachment can divert them from devotion. But then if there is aversion, if you are quarreled with someone, if you are angry with someone, and then we enter into the temple and we are taking the darshan of the Lord and we just hear the voice of that person. And immediately, such anger, why is this person here? This person is such a terrible person. And our mind starts you know, just crushing off on a movie. I'll do this, I'll do that. How dare this person do this? I want to tell everyone how terrible the person is. So then also we get carried away. Isn't it? 
aversion is also a distraction in devotion the bhagavatam the 11th canto tells us that uddhava gita krishna tells uddhava that nati sakto na api nirvinno it says that don't be too attached or be too averse it says be balanced and practice bhakti so if we start thinking that this world is a terrible place this world is a miserable place well okay but this is the world where we are in right now and this is the world where we have to serve so we can't have too many negative emotions uh, towards because ultimately towards the world because ultimately bhakti is performed in this world mishla prabhupad came from india to america if he had wanted to have a negative attitude he could have said people are so degraded in america actually when many of the hippies who were introduced who were the first people who were introduced to bhakti uh, in from the indian perspective uh, from the traditional indian brahmanical perspective the western world itself is considered a degraded place but the hippies were considered degraded even by western standards <laughs> so from prabhupad's perspective you could say they were degraded squared <laughs> isn't it but prabhupad did not look down upon them prabhupad never condescending towards them prabhupad saw the spiritual potential so that they had an interest in devotion and he was affectionate he was kind he was loving and many of the disciples of prabhupad if they they felt more loved by prabhupad than by anyone else in their lives so prabhupad was not averse we can take some statements of prabhupad and then we may say okay we become averse no so we have to have proper understanding that for most of us we want to attain krishna's abode but for most of us it is by going through this world that we attain krishna's world it is not by rejecting this world hmm. i'll conclude with one point that there is that there are there is karmis there are gyanis and there are bhaktas so the karmis glamorize the world those who are materialists they, oh you know this is so enjoyable that is so enjoyable that is so enjoyable. we just make this arrangement you'll enjoy life so the materialists glamorize the world then there are gyanis gyanis are the impersonal spiritualists the impersonalists they often demonize the world this world is full of illusion this world is temp this world is a dreadful place it's a treacherous place and this is one so the karmi is just turned towards the world the gyanis turned away from the world whereas the devotees they don't glamorize the world they don't demonize the world they utilize the world we utilize the world in the service of the source of the world so for us as sadhakas whatever situation we are in we need to be optimistic that okay the situation may look very terrible for me but this is the situation which by krishna's arrangement ultimately i am in this situation so how can i serve krishna in this situation sometimes we may find ourselves in a very incompatible situation devotionally our job may be very demanding sometimes the family members may not be practicing bhakti sometimes the the spiritual community where we are you might find that devotees are not that warm or receptive whatever we might feel that our situation is not very conducive to devotion and that can fill us with negativity also that oh this is so terrible this is so terrible this is so terrible now objectively speaking it may be that some situations are favorable to devotion some situations are unfavorable to devotion but however actually our growth in devotion depends not on the situation it depends on the intention if an unfavorable situation can strengthen our intention for serving krishna then actually through that we may grow much more than in a favorable situation where we take everything for granted So if we stay far, if we stay far away from the temple, far away from devotees, and that's why we feel I cannot go to a temple, I cannot go, I cannot have so much association, and now that's a geographical limitation. But then, when we come in association, we we treasure every moment. We try to take in as much Krishna conscious impulses as possible, and then even when we are not there, we are longing for it, we are cherishing it. Then actually. we can grow in our bhakti by that on the other hand some somebody who comes regularly to the temple but 
that person comes to the temple and some simply finds faults with everyone else. Sometimes our japa is like a radar japa. Radar japa means during chanting, we don't miss anything that anyone is doing. <laughs> this person is looking at their mobile. This person is sleeping. This person is pronouncing incorrectly. This person is sightseeing. This person is spacing out. We don't miss anything except the holy name. <laughs> <laughs> So somebody might actually have abandoned spiritual stimulus, but they may not be focusing on Krishna. They're focusing on so many other things. So when the unfavorable devotional situation is there for us, at that time, yes, we can pray to Krishna that, please make the situation more favorable so that I can serve more. But we don't make our devotion conditional to that prayer, fulfillment of that prayer. And we don't beat ourselves up also. Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Now, why is my situation like this? No, accept the situation and try to serve within that situation. If we can maintain the intention to serve Krishna, then that itself will take us towards Krishna. The journey towards Krishna is not just by physically going to a temple. This is by no means to minimize going to the temple. This is not, no, by no means to minimize the practical doing of devotional activities. But sometimes if you are not able to do, we don't have to lament. And say, okay, how can I serve Krishna in this situation? Learn about that. If we have that mood of learning, then we'll find that there is so much opportunity for us to connect with Krishna in every situation. Thus we can steadily move towards Krishna rather than stay wallowing in negativity. <laughs> So, <clears throat> if we see the history of the Krishna Consciousness Movement also, uh, there are so many times when Prabhupada faced so many obstacles. And quite often it was through the obstacles that the movement spread. And Prabhupada was in Mumbai, in Juhu. I was just two, three days, one week ago talking with Giriraj Maharaj. Uh, Giriraj Maharaj was writing a whole book on Prabhupada's Juhu project, how the Juhu temple was manifested. So what happened was initially the devotees, when they came to India, most of the dedicated followers of Prabhupada were non-Indians, were Western people. So they were, they attracted a lot of fascination, but still people had suspicion. Hey, you know, these are foreigners, and some people were saying that these are CIA agents, and there's a lot of negativity there at that time. And when there was this Mr. N, he gave, uh, he said that he will give money, give, give land for a money, for a temple at a cheap rate. At a cheap rate. Hmm? But then he found that he was not ready to, uh, he took the money and he was not ready to give the land. And then he tried to threaten the devotees. He tried to, oh, he tried to in many ways intimidate the devotees. So at one time, he basically uh, sent he bribed the local municipality and then they send their people to demolish the temple. There's a temporary structure. And they had to demolish it. And for the devotees, it was devastating. They had given their life for serving Krishna and it seemed that everything seemed to be going away. Now, we could have said, oh, this material world is a place of misery and things never work out. But the devotees were resourceful. The devotees contacted various influential people that they knew. Actually, Prabhupada had connected with them very well. But when Prabhupada was not there, people they did not were not able to similarly esteem Prabhupada's disciples. But at this time, when they came and they told this temple has been demolished, 
then it is so many influential people in Mumbai and various parts of India, they arose in protest. Says, How can you demolish a temple like this? And within just a matter of couple of days, the whole tide of public opinion turned to in support of the devotees. And that which seemed to be a great danger, it actually turned and became a great opportunity. And that support, then that support led to the subsequent. So at one level, that bad thing that happened, somebody came to demolish the temple. But through that, much, much more good came. So for us, when we are in situations where we find that we are somehow, we are in a difficult situation. Maybe it's materially, maybe it's spiritually, whatever it is. If we see that this is, Krishna has some plan over here then we won't let negativity choke us internally. Yes, I wanted to do this, this is not working. But just as the Ganga always keeps moving towards the ocean. If not this way, this way. If not this way, then this way. So as devotee is always, Krishna, I want to serve you. How can I serve you? If this is my plan, but this is not working. How can I serve you now? If we have that service attitude, then we will learn about the breadth of Krishna consciousness. Okay, I can't do this, but I can do this. In 2011, I was in the Juhu temple and I was doing Japa in the morning and somebody had spilled some water over there. And I didn't notice I was chanting. I just slipped on it. And I had polio in my legs since childhood. At that time, I used to wear a caliper, a brace. And when I fell, that leg with the brace got badly twisted. And I also had a osteoporosis in the left leg. So it's almost like the thigh came out of the... Uh, foot, the very bad fracture. And after that, my doctor told me that uh, we did a long surgery and everything. The doctor told me that you should not travel anymore now. Body cannot take travel. After that time, I was traveling only in India. Uh, but then, after that, once I was in the hospital, and my main service at that time was traveling and speaking. I was doing some writing, but traveling and speaking was my main, main service. So I was somewhat disheartened. And one day, I was giving a class on Skype to some devotees, while in the hospital itself, that I was recovering. In the morning I was giving a class and I was speaking about the six opulences of Lord Chaitanya. And I was absorbed in the class and because the internet was not very good, so there was no video, so I just closed my eyes and I kept speaking. And I kept speaking for 15 minutes. And I opened my eyes and I looked at my phone, I had almost like 30 missed calls. And I looked at the sky and I saw there was no connection. <laughs> <laughs> so, no connection. So, what had happened? As soon as I closed my eyes, somehow the internet went off. And I had been speaking for 15 minutes with my eyes closed, but there was nobody hearing. And then I, uh, I look, because I had put my phone on silent, the devotees had called me from there, but there was no way they could contact me. I was alone in that room. And I was so irritated. I just I wasted 15 minutes of uh, time just speaking with nobody hearing. But then, Later that day, when I was journaling, it just struck me that when I was speaking about Lord Chaitanya, speaking about Krishna, I was absorbed. Then it struck me that for speaking about Krishna, I don't need an audience. And it was that realization that helped me to start doing online outreach. Now many devotees do YouTube, Facebook Live, YouTube Live and things like that. But that time, uh, several years ago, nobody was doing that. Then I did the whole online Bhakti Shastri course. I started answering questions online. So, at one level, there was a physical limitation that I couldn't go out. But through that, I found a whole new avenue for outreach. So sometimes, if we keep lamenting about something which has gone wrong, then we miss out on some other opportunity that Krishna may provide for us. Of course, by Krishna's mercy, my health has recovered and I am able to travel also now. And another thing is that, in many ways, traveling abroad, outside India is much easier than traveling within India. <laughs> um, but uh, for all of us, when we are put in situations where we feel obstructed and restricted, instead of lamenting about it, if we see, Krishna has some plan. How does Krishna want me to serve him? Krishna, what can I do for you? If we have that attitude, then we will find that instead of just getting carried away by negative emotions, by the sentimentality, 
we will find a new way to connect with Krishna and we will become enriched with deeper and sweeter sentiments. So, the Bhagavad Gita talks about devotion that is world transforming. The Bhagavatam talks about devotion that is world trans. Arjuna is told to fight a war so that he can establish dharma in the world. But Shukadeva Goswami, Parikshit Maharaj is just forget the world, focus on Krishna. So both are valid approaches for practicing bhakti. But when we are in a particular role, we have to practice bhakti accordingly. So when Parikshit Maharaj was a, was a king, and when he heard the news that Kali is tormenting people, at that time Balakshit Maharaj did not say, Oh, everything is Krishna's plan. I just focus myself, absorb myself with hearing. Hearing about Krishna. At that time he went out and checked Kali. So when he was in that responsible position, he focused on world transformation. When he renounced the world, he focused on world transcendence. So for us, we can see sometimes if we are doing a particular service, and we are so choked in that service that we can't do anything. That time, we focus on world transcending. Just absorb ourselves in Krishna, raise our consciousness upwards. And maybe by that, some path will emerge of how we can move forwards. And sometimes if we feel that, oh, I'm not doing anything practical. Sometimes our mind is so devilish that whatever we do, the mind will make us feel, you know, we should be doing something else. If we start doing, taking our spiritual life very seriously, the mind will say that, Hey, what about your what about your professional life? What about your family life? Don't neglect that. You know, you have to be responsible. And we start doing that. And I say, ultimately, all this is temporary. This is so entangling. <laughs> this is so frustrating. Why are you doing this? Just practice bhakti. And you tell, you know, when I was doing that, you are telling me do this. Now, when I'm doing this, you are telling me do that. What do you want? Mind will say, I just want you to be miserable. <laughs> I just want you to be miserable. So the nature of the mind is, whatever situation we are in, the mind will keep us dissatisfied. So rather than giving in to that dissatisfaction, we find some way to serve Krishna and move on in our bhakti. So the material is the means to the spiritual for us. That is, we utilize the world to serve Krishna. Yeah. And for us, when we are practicing bhakti, uh, the ultimate sentiment that we want is, a sentiment of love for Krishna and that love for Krishna can come for us if we just connect with him. Now how far away from us is Krishna? You can say he's in the spiritual world, very far away. You can say he's in the heart, very close to us. It is Taddure Tadvanti Kedeshukhishan said. Actually, Krishna is just one thought away from us. Just one thought away. If you just think about him, we can experience his presence. We just think about him, he's there with us. So, no matter how many difficulties come in our life, instead of getting discouraged by those difficulties, we focus on Krishna. And then Krishna will show us the path ahead. Krishna will guide us forwards. When we give in too much to sentiments, see, we cannot give in to one emotion and then not give in to the other emotion. So if in general we are giving into a lot of emotions, then the negative emotions also will get come, we will get carried away by them also. So if somebody says somebody is mad for cricket and they jump in joy when India wins a cricket match, wins a cricket match. And then India loses a cricket match, and they say, I'm detached from cricket. <laughs> it won't work like that. So if we get too excited by material positive emotions, then we'll get too dejected by material negative emotions. So the way to avoid both is to become conscious of Krishna. And Krishna is just one thought away from us. If we become conscious of Him, He will give us the steadiness, He will give us the clarity, and we can move forwards in our life. So when we face problems which tend to fill us with, fill us with negative emotions, then we can think that actually Krishna is bigger than the biggest problem. So don't, as it is said, don't tell, don't tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big God is. Tell your problems how big God is. So focus on Krishna and we'll find that Krishna will show us a way through all of life's negativity towards Him who is the source of the ultimate positivity. So I'll summarize. I spoke about moving from sentimentalism to sentiments. The last two parts, we talked about the acronym FEEL. So the second E was what? From exhibition, 
expression yeah so exhibition means we just want to show the world how great a devotee i am expression means we want to connect with krishna by the practice of our bhakti so, so any really loving relationship emotion is not just kept in the heart it is expressed so we do need to express our emotions to krishna and when we exhibit then we we start becoming alienated from other alienated from krishna because our vision shifts to the world so we talk about rituals the word has a negative connotation but rituals are basically practices that help us to raise our consciousness from the material level to the spiritual level so spiritual but not religious they are that those people are right in the sense that we shouldn't become narrow minded or dogmatic and if, they, if that's what religion means that's fine but if spiritual but not religious means that we will not practice anything at all then it's like saying that i want i want to be healthy but i don't want to take any treatment or if you want to go up the mountain we have to find a path and take the path of the mountain so i talked about how our physical postures affect our emotions and there are rituals in every act of life in every feature of life every aspect of life rituals give us a structure by which we can express emotions and we can experience emotions so we by expressing emotions properly we can move forwards towards krishna and then i talked about two extremes with respect to ritual just reject them by being skeptical and cynical about them or just adopt them without thinking of their purpose that's niyama agraha so <clears throat> if you understand the purpose then we can fulfill the purpose by whatever practice helps Bhakti Nasir Akhil said that we have to go and bathe where the Ganga is flowing right now, not where it was flowing in the past. And the last was L. L was for what? Lamenting, Lamenting to learning. So if we get too caught up in our emotions, then sometimes our emotions can flood us with negativity. And if we misconstrue the philosophy, then the philosophy that the philosophical point that this world is a place of distress may aggravate our pessimism and distress. the distress is a fact of life but it is not the fact of the world but not the purpose of the world it's like a hospital so the gita's focus is not on this world as a distressful place but that by devoting ourselves to krishna we can go beyond this distressful place the karmis glamorize the world the gyanis demonize the world bhaktas utilize the world so just as attachment can divert us from krishna aversion can also divert us so if we start feeling too negative about people world and our worldly uh, relationships worldly positions then we have to avoid that aversion and how we avoid that aversion by understanding that devotion is not just about action it's also about intention if sometimes some situations are obstructing us in our devotion then in that situation we may be able to intensify our desire and that will lead to spiritual advancement so sometimes difficult situations can open new avenues for us to serve krishna the difficulties in the establishing of the juhu temple it help prabhupada and his followers to turn the tide of public opinion in favor of them for me the restriction of physical travel help me to discover about digital outreach more and more so for all of us rather than lamenting about the limitations that we are in we focus on connecting with krishna through the whatever situation we are in and we'll find that krishna is always there to guide us he's just one thought away from us so rather than lamenting about the obstacles rather than telling krishna about how big our problems are we focus on telling our problems how big krishna is thank you very much hare krishna or expression um could it be that like you said at home sometimes we may not even practice but then we um exhibit or show but is it also that um like if others are expecting us like just like our is kind yeah. of society we have a protocol you know how to behave in the temple and yeah. our practices So um even though we may not have the full expression we're exhibiting it um because 
like say, um, like addiction Ryan has um, trained many people, they want to show him that they're following his instructions and his teachings, you know, even if they don't have that full expression, or all of us. So, you know how um, it, it raises us up that we want to show that, yeah, I'm following the standards and the, and the way That's that true, yeah. devotees act. Thank you. I was supposed to express that point. I forgot about that. Thank you for the question. So, the question is that sometimes by exhibiting, uh, by doing a particular activity to show others that we are following the standards, that can also inspire us to, or at least keeps us at the standards, keeps us at the standards and helps us to grow. Yes, there is, I would say there are many different ways in which the internal and external can be correlated. The best is when the external is an expression of the internal. We have devotion for Krishna and we perform bhakti enthusiastically. That is the best. If that is, that is not the case, then the external can be an expression of our desire for the internal. I don't feel devotional, but I want to feel devotional. So, as I said, if we start doing Kirtan, we start feeling devotion gradually. So, we do the external uh, to, with a desire to develop the internal. Mm -hmm. The third is, we do the external to pretend to the world that we have the internal. Mm -hmm. And get whatever prestige that comes from that. In a pious society, if somebody acts as devoted, uh, then they can get a lot of uh, prestige in that society. So, we consider the external as expression, external as intention, and external as simply a show. For most of us, we will be usually around the second level. And if we are in the association of devotees, where we practice bhakti, not just to exhibit to others that I am practicing bhakti, but also with the desire to have that devotional feeling. But then the association gives us a stimulus. So I wouldn't use the word exhibition because the word exhibition has a negative connotation over there. It is, we are not just practicing bhakti to show others. We want to ourselves practice bhakti, but often having an external sense of accountability. It inspires us to do it more dedicatedly. So, if we know that others are observing me and that inspires me to do the right thing, then that is good because our mind, when we are alone, we are often alone with our mind. And our mind can wreak havoc with our life. <laughs> so, it's like being alone with, the, uh, with our worst enemy. So, uh, so, therefore, being with someone else if we are doing it just to show others, mm -hmm. then that is a problem. Mm -hmm. But if we also want to do it, but somehow we are not able to resist our mind and keep doing it, then having somebody else to external to help us, external to whom we are accountable uh, or whom we want to set an example to. Sometimes the people around us maybe are juniors also, mm -hmm. but we want to set an example to them. Then that can also help us. So it's a, it's if the, with the intention to develop the internal, if we if we do the external and we get some external support for that, that is actually uh, very vital for seekers who are growing. Uh, it said that when somebody is addicted to something, I was giving a talk to a group of people who are recovering from addiction in uh, in New Central New Jersey uh, some time ago. So it said that at, in addiction. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. It is most time people become addicted not just because the desire is so strong. The desire may be strong, but it is rather there is no one for them to connect with in their lives. Connect in a non-judgmental way. So if they can find somebody to connect with, then and then actually a lot of people can overcome their negativities. Mm -hmm. Portugal is the country in, in the world which has had the most dramatic success 
in uh, helping people overcome drug addiction and what they did was they just legalized all drugs and all the money that they were using to try to uh, catch and penalize drug users they started using it to rehabilitate to educate and rehabilitate the drug users so they started telling about what are the harmful effects of drugs and they also started creating support systems they said that uh, that if generally somebody is a drug user people don't want to employ such a person for a job also because you might just go high you might infect you might uh, make, addict, make others addicted so the government said that if you this person is a recovering drug user if you employ him we will pay half the salary and you pay him the half the salary so they created proactive measures to integrate the addicts into society and by that they have had tremendous success so the, now uh, this is just one example of the point that we need a connection we need association so the association is not just so that we make a show of things but association helps us to become better accountable to ourselves mm -hmm. and external accountability helps us develop a sense of internal accountability also so in that sense it's positive you want to ask a question thank you let's stop okay okay one last question Okay. So what made the public opinion change? Actually, Shri Prabhupada himself was widely respected as a saintly person. And his disciples were also seen as very extraordinarily very extraordinary in the sense that they were western people who had become dedicated to prabhupada's mission but at that time the cold war was going on and india was aligned although india is part of the non alignment movement but still practically india was aligned with the ussr and usa supported pakistan quite a bit at that time so indians uh, had a lot of suspicion about america and americans in general but when the devotees actually came out and they said they explained how we are trying to build a temple and how they so the whole cause of building a temple came into the public eye and then articles were written about how these devotees had left so much from so much material prosperity and they had come to dedicate their lives and then not only that when some when prabhupada had gone to many many influential people's houses and he had taken prasad they had become life members but this was not known generally to the public but when this temple um, when this temple was attempted to be demolished at that time many of these influential people in india they came out publicly in support of prabhupada publicly in support of the krishna consciousness movement and these were the opinion leaders in society at that time and their public Uh, public uh, statements as well as the uh, the wider knowledge of the devotees sacrifice and dedication all that helped to change the tide of the public opinion okay did the devotees do anything specific did the devotees do anything specific yeah i would say that they they generally they didn't uh, devotees were just doing their own services in terms of they were making people life members doing hari naam and building the temple but that's the time when they tried to go broader to the media and they specifically made a concerted effort to reach out to the media to the newspapers to the at that time they're not tv so much but to the newspapers primarily and through that uh, that broader outreach there are different layers of outreach uh, levels of outreach some outreach is meant to help make people devotees some outreach can be just to create well wishers so in our movement traditionally we have focused primarily on making devotees that's important when prabhupada started the bhaktivedanta institute which was his wing for scientific outreach he said the purpose of the bi is to increase the prestige of iskon now prestige is not in a egoistic sense it is just that there is a scientific basis to what we are practicing so prabhupada did not really expect people who are committed to science to become devotees they became that's wonderful but that's not the immediate expectation 
so if we do that broader outreach when we create positive awareness of what we are doing that also helps us in the long run to do the direct outreach also so the devotees did that in a big way at that time okay so thank you very much shila prabhupad ki gaur bhakt vrind ki jai gaur premanande Thank you.